Begin this morning, then we'll sing our opening hymn in number 456, verses 1 through 5.
Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, for the Lord have mercy, we will sing this the first time. You are invited just to listen if you'd like and join in as well. The congregation will sing the bolded lines. We will then sing it through a second time.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is recorded in Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. Because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the song of the day today, I will speak these words for us. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my heart secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have delightful inheritance. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the ground of the dead, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I invite the congregation to join with me, and the glory be to the Father. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading, then, is found in 1 Corinthians 15. This will serve as our sermon later. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our pre preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people who most be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as an Adam will die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the words and works of our Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you. Easter, when the disciples were together, 
with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. And so Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated then for our hymn of the day, hymn number 470.
Christ. Amen. The message for our meditation is found in our second lesson in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection of the dead is a fact. Plain and simple, it happens. Anybody who denies it has no idea what they're talking about. They have no knowledge of that history whatsoever. This actually occurred. Now to that, people might say, but this is part of a religion. And a religion is based on a, a hope that may or may not be true. Not for Christianity. That's the case for all other religions out there. We are not talking about a religion that is based off of one man who was illiterate, speaking to an angel and finding some gold plates that were written in Egyptian. We are not talking about another prophet, some guru who concocted a religion because he, he spoke to a different angel in a cave. We are talking about a God who actually exists, who has written down his word through men, and not with one man, and not over the course of just a singular lifetime, but over the course of thousands of years. How is it that the Bible points to events that have not yet taken place, and yet have them all come true? Only because God knows what he is talking about. So there is intrinsic evidence within the Bible itself explaining that this is true, besides just the fact that the Holy Spirit works upon the hearts of the hearers of God who get to hear this and then be given the gift of faith. But there is also this extrinsic uh, evidence that is going on where we get to, or this external evidence where we get to see uh, how this actually happened. There is history of this all going down. There actually was a Jesus of Nazareth. He actually did live in Galilee and he did get sent in by Pontius Pilate to death. He died. There were many witnesses of that fact. He was put into a, a tomb, and there was evidence of that fact as well. The enemies of God actually are the ones who give us some of the most solid external evidence to that. They went ahead and made sure that that tomb was secure. They placed a seal on it, they placed soldiers in front of it, and then they put a, a big stone in front of the tomb as well. And then Jesus, yes, did rise. He actually rose from the dead, just as all the prophets had talked about, just as he himself had promised within his own life. And we will talk about the evidence for that a little bit later on. But even with all of this, you have to admit, it's pretty hard to believe. How in the world can we believe that the resurrection has happened, especially since we haven't seen it with our own eyes? The Corinthians were wondering the same exact thing. There was a lot of doubt going on within their congregation about this, that the, the resurrection from the dead was real. And there were some who were even preaching in the fact that it wasn't real. So God had gifted them Paul. And Paul was there to speak to them on a number of issues, but here especially too, about the resurrection, about what was going on. <clears throat> Why was it that these Corinthians were we're, we're doubting that the resurrection would happen. But we can kind of see why. First of all, they had some cards stacked against them. They were Greeks, and being Greeks, who were some of their heroes? Not just the, the false gods, the Hercules, who was, I guess, not fully God, but you have Zeus, you have Hera, things like that. You have all those gods, but then their heroes are the philosophers, men like Plato. And Plato said, there's no resurrection. And many other philosophers have agreed with him on that. Paul experienced that firsthand when he went to Athens and spoke to these philosophers at the meeting of the Areopagus. Many doubted that the resurrection from the dead would actually happen. So these men, their, their uh, words carried weight. People listened. The second thing that was going against the Corinthians was, again, that they were Greeks. And they themselves loved philosophy, and they loved science, and they loved logic. And all these things are fine in and of their own selves. In fact, they are good. But the devil uses them, of course, to go and try and tear down the word of God. And that's what he was doing right here. He was trying to get them to take a look at what had happened and say, oh, I haven't seen it. Okay, so it must not be true. So that's where the Corinthians were struggling. That's why they were doubting that it actually took place. And that's why some preachers were gaining weight, stating that, no, it didn't actually happen. That's when Paul goes ahead and says what he does here. 
But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. Or if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those, who, uh, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Since the Corinthians were so concerned with logic and with uh, Ra uh, the rational thought that was going on here with deductive reasoning, Paul decided to play their game a bit. He gave in to them and allowed them to set the scene for how this conversation was going to go down. Okay, if you want to speak logically, we will. That's what Paul did here. Paul was ready because he knew that the resurrection was real and he knew that the assumptions and their, their logical conclusions that they were making were actually illogical and downright foolish. What Paul was doing here was practicing a form of what we call Christian apologetics. He was defending the faith, not so much by saying, I have to defend God, but by going on the attack, by pointing out the falsehoods of other people's thoughts that disagree with God. We still do this to this day. And it is not because God needs any help. It is not because his word is not sufficient or it is not good enough. The reason for doing this is to tear down those obstacles that stand in the way from a person hearing God's word. To tear down how foolish the devil can be in his lives. So that's what Paul was doing here. You guys love logic? All right, well, start thinking logically because right now you're not. The first way that they weren't thinking logically was their assumption that the resurrection from the dead cannot be real if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. Because that's what these preachers were preaching. They were stating a both and situation. Christ has risen, absolutely, we believe that, we'll teach that, but none of you guys are gonna rise from the dead, nor will anybody else. That's not the way that this works. Yes, Jesus is God, absolutely, but Jesus is 100% human being. He was born of a woman. He was born under the law, just as all of us are. So, if he rose from the dead, that means that the resurrection is real for humanity. It's like the situation of, what, four minute mind. Human beings can't do that until the four, first person ended up being able to run it. Now, that doesn't mean that all of us are going to be capable of doing it, but it is possible for the human race. Not the greatest analogy here, but it is an example of what we're talking about. If Christ has been raised, Christ who is a human being has been raised, then the resurrection has to be real. And if there is no resurrection, then Christ cannot be raised either. Which then takes us down some other problems. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, your preaching is useless, and so is your witness. And all that you're, you're left with is sin. If Christ has not been raised, this means that you no longer get to go to the throne of grace and say, Father, I know I have messed up, but go to the cross and see what your Son has done for me. Look to Him and see how He has lived that perfect life and died that perfect death in my place. You don't have that option. Because if Christ has not been raised, it means that the sacrifice wasn't worth it. It didn't match up to the level that God wanted. The resurrection is proof of God's satisfaction that everything that needed to take place for it to be finished was finished. But if he had not been raised, okay, Christ did not do it. And then you are on your own. And you have to go to him with your own merit, which is absolutely worthless. You have to go to him with your own good works, which on their own self are worthless uh, pieces of rags. That is all that we have. We cannot go to God with that, because we are going to be killed. 
This then means that every loved one that we have ever had, every human being who has ever existed, would be in the same boat. And they, once they breathe their last breath, would be sentenced immediately to hell. Because the person is only sentenced once. So, this is what happens if there is no resurrection from the dead. But, what about our time here? Because we have these 80 or 90 years upon this earth. Who cares? First of all, you're wasting your time being here right now. You're wasting your time praying to God because he's not going to listen to you when you have no access to him. You're wasting your time looking to God for comfort. You're wasting your, your time praising him or singing to him. You're wasting all of your time with your offerings. All of that is true. But in addition to that, your entire life is worthless. What good is it to have a family or to have a job or to be able to enjoy a nice meal? Because in the grand scheme of things, yeah, you might get some enjoyment out of these 80 or 90 years here, but it's all worthless because in the end, it's just a blip on the radar compared to the rest of eternity where we will be in the hellfires with Satan himself. That is what is true if there is no resurrection. To all of this, Paul's enemies back then, and still to this day, they point out that Paul's logic here is, is pretty foolish. He's taking this to the extreme, almost making a, a, a joke out of all of this. One of his enemies' biggest arguments is that he's, he's in some way setting up a straw man, and in another way he's also following down a, a slippery slope. He, he, they're saying that because this is true, now Paul is saying that all these other things are, are true, and that just can't be. But is that what Paul is doing? Or is he actually walking through what God himself has put out? Because these people still want to hold on to the Bible, and that they want to casually discard those things that they don't uh, agree with. That's not how faith works. You, you can't just pick and choose. If you're going to go with God and allow Him to be the highest authority on the matter, you have to do that in all regards. That's what Paul was doing now. If there is no resurrection, then all there is is hell. Plain and simple. He is not going down and setting up a slippery slope form of logic. He is not making a comedy out of this entire matter. Rather, he is showing the logical tragedy that is going to follow if Jesus has not been risen. Another argument that they claim that Paul is making here with all of this is that they are, are, are saying that he is making appeal to the emotions. You better believe this, even if it's not true, because at least in this way you're going to feel good about the matter. And you're going to have some comfort for the time being. We, we don't care if it's actually true or not, but listen to your emotions. They're going to provide the insight and the logic necessary for this all go down. That's not what he's basing his logic on, though. That's not where Paul is getting his facts from. Paul is basing his logic and his facts in this matter from the God who, yes, to the world is foolish, but to the God who actually sees things through. There actually was a res re resurrection from the dead. We are not, again, talking about a singular human being who is his guru for all those who follow after him because he found something in the cave. We are talking about more than 500 people who at a singular time ended up seeing Jesus Christ risen from the dead. We are talking about all the apostles who saw it, and countless women just on that singular day of Easter we are witnessing all these people over the course of these 40 years that saw Jesus rise. This happened. We're not talking about one man or even two or three people. We're talking about a lot of people. And this then sees to it that the resurrection is foolish. Paul's logic, uh, or is foolproof. Paul's logic, God's way of reasoning here is sound and reasonable. It is the enemies who are off base. And that is why Paul goes forward with, with his own conclusion and God's as well. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. These Corinthians, there were those amongst them who were claiming again that there was no resurrection based off of what? their own insight, their own experience. The thing is, that's one of the biggest logical fallacies you can commit, called anecdotal evidence. You're basing what you think or what you know off of cherry-picked statistics. 
okay, say that these people were older people, they were elderly, they had seen the world, they had had that wisdom of that this life gets to give to us. Okay, but still, does a person living in Corinth, do they have knowledge of all the events of the world from their own time? But no. So how are they going to recognize this thing that they have not seen with their own eyes that has happened? This, again, is cherry picking. It is a logical fallacy. It plain and simple. Paul, on the other hand, didn't see the resurrection. He saw it with his own eyes. Not like the most of the people who got to see Jesus risen from the dead. Not during those 40 days after he rose until he ascended into heaven. But Paul saw him nonetheless. He saw him as he was on his way to Damascus. And that bright light appeared and Jesus spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why are you kicking against the goats? And then he went ahead and he made him one of his own apostles. And then he taught Paul on top of it as well, training him for what needed to take place. Paul saw this. So with all that in mind, Paul then shows that because Jesus has risen, he then is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That word there, first fruits, has some implications behind it. The first is that Jesus is greatest of those who have risen from the dead. The second is that there are going to be others who follow after him. There is going to be a second and a third. There is going to be more and more who follow after him because he has proven that the resurrection is possible for human beings, for mankind. That is what God is showing him. And he is also showing that Jesus is not some anomaly. If Adam, who was a human being, not God, just human being, if he can sort of change the course of history for all mankind, because he allowed his wife to go and eat from that fruit, from the tree that God told him not to eat from. If Adam has that capability to bring death into this world because of his one sin, how much more won't this man, who is also God, Jesus Christ, be able to change the course of history for all mankind? If Adam was able to bring death, what is preventing Jesus, the true God, the King of Kings, from bringing life because he rose from the dead? That is what is happening. That God is taking this greatest of all enemies, death, and he is now using it to demonstrate that life is here, that the resurrection has occurred. But what of us, who are like Thomas during that first week after the resurrection, who have not seen that the Lord had risen? What about us, who have not witnessed it with our own eyes? Think about a few things. You haven't witnessed a lot. Yes, you may have lived longer than maybe some people here on this earth. But who of you have witnessed Alexander defeating the Persians? Who of you have witnessed Caesar crossing the Rubicon? Who of you witnessed the Revolutionary War? None of us have. And yet, all of these things happen. We believe them to be true because there is evidence of the fact. So why is it that we will believe those things, but we will not believe the fact that the resurrection has occurred when there is history, when this actually has happened? In addition to this, most importantly, your own God is telling you it has occurred. The resurrection is real. In your eyes, you might not have seen it yet. But like Job, your eyes will. Eventually, your sight of faith will give way to the, the sight that is reality because your own eyes will see. There in front of you upon that last day, you will see Jesus Christ with those own eyes. You will see your own body glorified and wonderful and resurrected. Yes, your own body, not the body of some other person, beauty, but your body glorified and resurrected nonetheless. This is the hope that we have. Because Jesus has risen, your faith is not futile. You are not in your sins. You have been forgiven because God has proven it through this. Jesus rose, so do you. Amen. Please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We confess our Christian faith together according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for prayer. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce its fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love for all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make and minister and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel. Care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to many useful tasks. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you who now rest in their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose together. Amen. We continue with the offering.
please rise. Turn to page 14 in the bulletins. Uh, we go ahead and we will sing in these words of the preface. They're very similar to what we had in the Red Room.
for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
that is it for our announcements. God's richest blessings to you in the rest of this week.